Good morning. Um, there'll be a picture of fog in just a second, so this uh, fits perfectly. Um, yeah, so I'm feeling rather privileged to have the chance to speak to you uh, this morning as keynoter. Um, it's really great also to follow on from the other three keynotes we had because they're all, for me, very key topics. Um, I'll be looking at them in a slightly different direction or from a different perspective today, but the topics of um, the student voice, seeing everything from a student's perspective or from the learner perspective, maybe to be a bit more expansive, um, looking at the possibilities of digitalization for changing our ideas of learning space, I think is also important. And also, of course, the importance of thinking about social, injust social injustice, social justice, and inclusivity in higher education and in the education system generally. Um, you may know that I work quite a bit on the policy level. Um, so my perspective on a lot of this will be really from a kind of a macro perspective, thinking more about how the system of education, of higher education, could change in the future. Um, I should mention also that um, I'm adjunct professor at uh, Novo Gorica University, um, and uh, you know they are one of the conveners of the summer school um, Open Education for a Better World. Uh, we've also got a master program starting the end of next year on leadership in open education. And I also work for a learning platform called Kiron. Uh, Kiron is based in Berlin. Uh, we are quite a young organization. We pretend a little bit still to be a startup, although we're five years old, and we have um, about 80 staff now. Um, but we started out by taking up the topic of um, how, do, how can we support refugees to get into higher education um, and how can we use digitalization to support that. And I actually joined them um, earlier this year because I just thought, okay, I've been doing a lot of work on the top level, kind of talking about change, talking about the things we want to have. I'd like to get more involved in actually doing it, and so that's why I'm at Kiron, and it's given me already great insights into some of the challenges of, um, you know, this, what we're calling wide open learning, and I'll talk a bit about that um, at the end as well. But firstly, a picture of fog. Um, I'm, I've been living many, many years in, um, in Germany, but um, I'm British, and very, of, uh, very often when I go home, I live very near to Wales, and uh, my thing is always to go out with my dad. We go to a mountain bike park, and I go mountain biking. Now, the point is, for me, I'm not interested in my mountain bike. In fact, in this case, it was a mountain bike that I hired. What I'm interested in is the experience of the mountain biking. I'm interested in the flow. I'm interested in the challenges and all of that. So I think we can take that a bit as an analogy to one way for us to think about education and how it's organized and all of these cool things, including open education, that we think about. So here's a list of things that I'm actually not really interested in. I'm not interested in open educational resources, not in, interested in open education, not in artificial intelligence, digitalization of education or, or open badges. Not in the first instance, because I'm really interested in higher education. And I think we have major goals um, for higher education at the moment. I also think we can think much more expansively about what we mean with higher education, and we'll come to that, I think, when we come to some of the pathways uh, I want to present. But I think uh, I, this is a, a, a list that we developed when we were thinking about what might the future of higher education look like. But in fact, this is a list that applies, I think, in very, very many contexts although in our case it was particularly for the German context and also for the European context. But I think part of what we have to do at the moment in a situation where a lot of reform is happening in education, um, we're talking a lot about the significance of higher education and lifelong learning for creating you know, sustainable societies, societies able to cope with the huge change coming at us, 
then these are the kind of key things, I think, which are part of what we've often called the university experience, but we've often seen as implicit parts of this experience. And I think now, when we think of reforming and changing, we have to make everything that until now has been more kind of implicit ideas much more explicit, because then we can check whether all the reforms, all the ideas we've got are really helping or contributing to, for us to achieve those goals. So the study programs need to reflect and react to developments in society. This is, of course, why we see such a focus on higher education and lifelong learning at the moment. Um, I was in the German Federal Ministry uh, two days ago, and we were talking about possible changes to the study aid program, and uh, the representative for the ministry was saying, you know, forget about investment in um, uh, innovation in companies, forget about um, thinking about how we're going to support people um, getting housing. Let's really, really focus everything on uh, developing uh, skills and competencies in society because this is the key to sustainability. And so and our idea really of higher education is that this means for us not just giving skills but enabling people to reflect on those skills, be critical about society, but also to think about what future reforms they would like to have in society. So I think, again, the, the education experience in higher education should be about maybe even kind of practicing social reform um, so that the graduates can go out and actually enact this in the future as well. And I mentioned already a very key thing, which is I think we have to think also more expansively about learning spaces. Um, this is a, something I'm particularly directing at higher education. Um, when you see a lot of discussions at the moment about how higher education should be changing, one of the big things is, yeah, there's these great kind of fab labs. We need fab labs on campus. We don't need fab labs on campus. We need to connect to the fab labs that exist in the community. We need to open higher education. That's, that's really more about it. So higher education shouldn't be this kind of enclave. It should be a place which is always reaching out and, and bringing people in. And when we think about bringing in, it's very important to know that uh, the day before yesterday was World Access to Higher Education Day. Um, this is done by a, a friend and colleague of mine uh, from the UK, uh, but it's a, a hugely global initiative now. Um, on that day, there were many, many tweets from right across the world, from universities, um, from groups of students or people in the community, making efforts to try and make higher education more inclusive. This is because it's a challenge in every single country of the world. You know, sometimes we just think, oh, it's just our country. So Germany, for example, we know we've got a huge challenge there. But our challenge is, is let's say, different to countries like, let's say, the UK, where uh, because on the first instant one would say, okay, Germany, we don't have tuition fees. We don't have tuition fees, but we have other forms of selection, which is creating a rather exclusive higher education experience. So we need to think about this, and that's why I think we need to kind of re-look at higher education, um, and that's what I'm going to uh, present to you. And then we can come back to the thing about, okay, what about open education? How, what role can it actually play? So a number of years ago, I was asked by um, the UNESCO Global Education Report to prepare a background report on indicators for the new, um, uh, the new uh, Sustainable Development Goal for which was also related to higher education, which is uh, either 4.3 or 4.4. And uh, one of the things uh, it says in that goal is that uh, um, there should be access to high-quality learning, including in, higher, in, in, in universities, for all. And one of the things we were thinking in the group when we were working on this is, what does this for all really mean? And then we kind of get, got more to this kind of traditional idea. Yes, chances and opportunities for all, but there can still be some kind of selection. So I actually propose now 
on reflection and thinking over the last couple of years about all the projects I've been doing and people uh, I've been meeting, that I would actually like to totally reformulate this goal um, for su uh, sustainable development in education related to higher education. I think it helps hugely if we start from this perspective, which is, why don't we just say, let's assume everybody we see will some point in their lifetime take part in higher education. This, I, I think, is, is a, a, hugely, um, a, a huge change in perspective. Instead of the thing which I've been also used, working on many years, which is, okay, we see their selection, who are the people who, who are not being included in higher education, and how can we support this group? So I would like to change it the other way around, say, let's just assume everyone is going to come to higher education. That means then we have to think about, okay, so that means some people will be older, many people will have very, very uh, heterogeneous um, learning biographies, so we have to think how we can support that. People will not be able to study full-time, how can we support that? So this kind of change in perspective, I think, is quite helpful. And now we come to some of the ideas we developed uh, within um, the study we did uh, for the German government. And um, I think it's really true that very often in, when we're thinking of higher education, we're thinking of a kind of a closed ecosystem. Now, very often the closed ecosystem will be the campus. And many people who are, for example, against, you know, digitalization will be saying, okay, but we need... We need the campus experience. So they're thinking of this kind of closed ecosystem where everything is controlled, the student needs support, etc., but it's all within a particular place. If you look at the worst iterations of digital learning, it's the same idea. Only in that case, the, the, uh, the ecosystem is the learning platform and the interaction of the student through their computer, through their laptop. So that's why I think it's really important to think about uh, how education, how our higher education is organized, and also maybe to change this perspective from the student. This is a great photo, I think it was from 19, uh, uh, 1980, yes, for first forms of digitalization. In many, 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 many uh, universities, it might not like, look like this, but it feels like this, I think, to the students, for sure, and often it's, that's the way we organize higher education. Now, the interesting thing is, let's take more of a perspective um, from what it's really like for students. Uh, this picture on, um, on the left, this is quite interesting. I was uh, stuck one time on, uh, on a journey uh, through Germany, and um, I had a longer stop than planned in um, Mannheim. And sometimes I just think, oh, let's just, it's just kind of fun to go and visit a university. So I went to this university um, and just tried to find a place also where I could sit down and work. And so I was sitting here and I realized above this room on the left was an auditorium where a lecture was going on. In the lecture, there were about 20 people sitting really spread out in the room, nobody really paying attention. In this learning space, all around the lockers, were students working together in small little groups, working collaboratively collaboratively on their learning, um, the, the, on, on their university experience, as it were. So I think that's one really important point. And we can see, for example, this is a picture I was very uh, recently at the University of Cyprus. Um, they have a new library, and we see at the moment this kind of re-emergence of libraries as centers of learning. And um, they've spent a lot of uh, resources and money as well um, on making this fantastic library, um, but it's, it's, it's full of people working, full of people studying, and they've also said um, this is not open just for students, but it's open for the whole community. So I think this is something about these learning spaces. So another thing, what about what we really think about how students are actually living? So um, for about 10 years, from 2005 to 2015, I was the international coordinator of a big study um, where every three years we did um, a survey of students in uh, 30 countries in Europe to find out about uh, where the students came from, but also 
um, how they were spending their time, where their money came from, um, what they were studying. So we tried to kind of understand almost the, the socio-demographics around their studies. So the latest figures show us that 51% of students in Europe work alongside their studies. The other thing they say, and this is really interesting, is we asked um, this, we, we set up this one question, which is to ask students, do you feel primarily like a student who works alongside their studies, or primarily like somebody who's working and is studying alongside their work. And you can see here how this change happens the older somebody is. And I think this is really important for us to consider as well, this kind of way students are perceiving their, you know, uh, their, their, their identity as a student. So you see, the older the student is, the more they're saying, yes, I really, really want to study, and study is really important to me, but it's only one thing in my life. And many times, also on a policy level, and this was something, this was one of the slides we discussed uh, two days ago at the federal ministry, on, on that kind of level, people don't think like that. Because they think, yeah, of course the student is, is studying full-time and their, their full concentration is on their study. That, is only, that can only be possible for one group of students. So when we start thinking of trying to be more expansive, trying to get, offer more learning opportunities, we have to be realistic about how students are living as well. Another thing is, um, and you may have seen this because, um, or, or this idea because it's been, become popular over the last year, this idea of the 100-year 100, 100 career. Or, um, and, and when you start thinking like that, then you think about, okay, well, how might learning happen within that? Now, our general idea of education is it's, it's kind of like a one-way track. You get on this track, and at some point you exit it, and you never go back. Now, I actually promised my uh, daughter that I wouldn't tell another anecdote about her, but unfortunately, and I, she knows I don't think this is good, she thinks she's at the end of this track as well. So she's 24, she's done her bachelor and master, now she's working, she's like, okay, I never have to learn again. <laughs> That's not true, but our education system is planned as if it were true. And this is really a problem, you know, and I really don't think it's helpful at the moment where we make this split between higher education and further education. It's much more fuzzy than that, and especially if we're going to be more inclusive. This is just something funny I saw the other day. Um, I'm part of um, one of these European university consortiums, um, and um, this was at the University of Exeter, uh, no, Essex in the UK, which, to be fair, is a very, very inclusive university. Um, but they had this funny sign um, just near the, uh, the, the guest house. And I actually happen to know what a ha-ha is, which is this kind of funny gap here. It's, um, but I just really like the actual uh, the text here, um, which says, we don't take any responsibility for injuries resulting from play or other activities. And I thought maybe that's also the kind of thing of the way we see formal education. It's like, no, this is serious. Don't play around. You know, get your studies done. So I think this is the whole thing about we have to think much more about these open learning spaces where we can experiment because experimenting is part of higher education, I think. And then I also think it's uh, nice. I've been following uh, Ron Barnett for, for a long time in his many studies, um, always rethinking the place of uh, higher education and university education within today's society. Um, and um, I found this interesting because I really think some of his earlier books were really focused a bit on the uh, research university. He then also had a book which I think was called The Entrepreneurial University. But now this idea um, of what he's calling the ecological uh, university, I think this is really the interesting one, which is the university for others. So it's, again, it's this idea of an open university which is for the community. So then, um, uh, one of the topics I've been working on the last few years is also thinking about digitalization and how that might help us to open up spaces. And of course, when we're thinking of digitalization, then you know, that 
helps us build up networks, uh, communication, and it helps us to build it in such a way that we can use that for these new uh, learning spaces. But we know for sure in, in, in every country, um, I know probably better in, in Germany, but I know for sure in, in most of Europe at least, um, these opportunities are not being taken up by the universities. Uh, when we did this study uh, on the future of higher education, and I'll present some of the pathways in a second, the kind of disappointing point for me was when we were looking at really cool, looking for really cool um, initiatives or, or institutions which were doing this kind of thing, they're always on the periphery of the formal system, not in the center of it. And, and, and that's a bit of the point, that we, we have to try and think about how we can move this right into the center. So now the four learning pathways. Now the thing about this four learning pathways idea is this was a study we were asked to do by the German government, and the actual contract was, or the commission was, to look at how digitalization um, would change higher education uh, running up to 2030. And uh, we, we're an international consortium, um, with, and, and we particularly looked at changes in the work market or in the job market, changes in technology itself, changes in the uh, didactics and the way we learn, and then also obviously changes in the student body. And um, quite early on in this study, we went back to the ministry and we said this is not really going to be about digitalization. We think the key point is to think about the learner and let's look at everything from the perspective of the learner. And this is where we came up with these four pathways, which we think kind of sketch um, the higher education landscape moving up to 2030. But very important for us was not to do something which is kind of just in the future. All of these ideas we developed, we think they exist now, but they're not systematic. They're not kind of, often they're not very big, and they're not really supported um, in the way uh, the normal uh, higher education system is. And um, I also did a study a number of years ago where we looked at, um, uh, in Europe, different access routes into higher education and how they're organized. And we also came up with four different kind of types. And we made the mistake of calling the types type one, two, three, and four. And every time when we were talking to other people about it, we couldn't remember ourselves which were the types. <laughs> so we got round that this time by actually um, calling our different models um, by the names of toys. So um, the first model, and you saw as a small instance of it right at the beginning, is what we're calling uh, Tamagotchi. And in a minute, I'll present them a little bit more in detail. But the important thing about Tamagotchi is not only this idea that it's uh, a closed ecosystem, but it's also this idea of this one block that I was talking about. Higher education is one block. Now, this one block might be that you do um, a bachelor and leave, but it might be you do a bachelor and then a master's, or even a bachelor, master's, and a PhD. But it's still this idea, it's one block. Maybe you do something else later, which we're calling further education, but the system is not really interested in that. When we take then the, the next model, um, this is Jenga. This is, you know, this, this game, you'll see a picture of it in a minute, you know, this game where you build up uh, towers. The point of that idea is that what about if the first part of higher education was shorter and more focused, but it already assumed you would be doing other bits later and it kind of planned them in. The third one, Lego, is really uh, what, what we've probably been talking about and which is... Um, probably is quite disruptive. It's just a question of can you support it in such a way that it's also inclusive. And then Transformer is something that, at least in Europe, has been a huge thing over the last 20 years, which is how can we open up higher education for adults, for older people? And the thing is, we've done that, but we normally treat them as soon as they get to the university as if they were 18. So I'm going to present each of these models a little bit in detail. So the first one uh, was Tamagotchi. 
The point about it is we still believe that there will be lots of changes. There's lots of changes that can happen around the classic university model. And the other thing is, um, if we think, because we always thought for each of these models about exactly these points of the job market, the didactics, technology and organisation, then there is um, a strong argument for this kind of model, particularly for, for young people who are going into um, higher education. They need support, uh, at least at the beginning of their studies, to be able to kind of as, as one would say, become academics. So you support them for self-reflection. You give them support in what kind of courses they should be doing. And you, you support them didactically along the way. But of course, the whole time is, this is kind of pro, this is pre-programmed in a certain way. So in, in fact, that's about the, the didactics. Now on the job market, what we've noticed in the job market is, um, the job market has been through a phase where they say, I only want ready-made, fully-fledged graduates. So they have kind of promoted, at least in part in Europe, that people not only just do a bachelor, but uh, follow up with a master's. And then they get to, um, to the job market. And then we still hear from the job market, OK, no, these are not exactly the people I wanted. But part of this idea still, and the answer from higher education is, yes, but they've, earned, they've, they've learned what we call graduate attributes, and that will also make them, that will give them the skills which will help them not only work now, but also adapt to changes in work in the next uh, 10, 20 years on the labor market. So there is an idea behind that, but of course when we see changes and, and how technology has been used within this system is always an add-on because the organizational structure is pretty much the same as it was before. So that's the point. Can we actually break this out a little bit? So and this is when we get to uh, the Jenga model. And this is the idea of, it's quite a didactical model actually because it's the idea of maybe when we take this, we build this kind of tower which is what we first think is the course, which is the bachelor course or the master course. Maybe we can rethink it and think that maybe not all of those elements in it are absolutely necessary. We could take them out and say, okay, those kind of elements can be learned through uh, modules much later in life. And maybe those modules will also be offered by different educational providers. The interesting question here is what role could the university play within this? And I think the university could play a key role because they could maybe even design the whole bachelor program with the assumption that part of it won't be offered by them, but they'll be still accrediting it. So I think there is a role of this, still, this big idea that we had also in the, what we're calling the Tamagotchi model, but making it more flexible and thinking much more about this thing that uh, there are changes on the labor market which we can react to, but at the same time, this is maybe more inclusive for some students who feel, yes, I want to do, I want to learn something in higher education, but I want to know it's something I can use relatively quickly. So this kind of only doing um, maybe a two-year program, so uh, in, in, in Europe we've got an expansion of two-year programs at the moment, but it shouldn't be just a two-year program. It should still be um, accompanied with a big kind of didactical and, and uh, educational plan of what that pathway should be. If we don't do that, it still remains relatively socially selective. And that's why when we get onto the next model, that's why that's such a key element. Now, this Lego idea um, is really this idea that what about if the student or the learner is completely in charge of what they do? So they go out and they decide what they want to do. This doesn't have to just be um, things online, which I think was a little bit of this idea of kind of the, with, with the first kind of moot hype, which is you, you sit at home and you just pick up pieces. These, some of these uh, phases that you could be learning, they can be present phases. You could be doing six months at a campus, or it, it could, could be longer or shorter than that. But the point is, um, you are actually, you as the learner, you are actually de uh, designing this learning pathway yourself. Now, of course, you need a lot of advice for that. There's two elements you need. You need a lot of advice for that, and you also need a much more flexible system of recognition. 
because that system has to be able to recognize all those pieces so they're really valuable to you as the learner. And there, then, that's when things like uh, open badges or micro-credentials can play a key role, I think. Then we get to um, the, the, the final model, the, the, the transformer model. Again, this is something we see all the time um, in recent reports now, which is we see this idea not only that we have to offer higher education to those who maybe have missed out earlier on, but we also see this idea now that there's so much changing in the labor market, people will definitely have to go back to university or, or go back to, to, to studies to learn more. Now, the didactical challenge here and the one that absolutely hasn't been fulfilled is you've got two elements to this group. The first element is it's a long time since they were at school. So one point is they may have um, uh, forgotten certain things. They may be slightly out of practice. How do you do tests and all these you know, artifacts that we have in our educational system. But the other thing is, it could well be that uh, the, 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 the younger um, pupils are learning new things which these people haven't been able to learn. So on the one hand, you need to support this group a lot, especially at the beginning phase of, of higher education. On the other hand, they're bringing masses of experience with them from um, from uh, families, from communities, from being in the labor market, and all of that they want to see reflected in their studies. This also will help them a lot because they need particularly to have something which they can use to get them jobs after their studies as well. So they need to be able to kind of bring in this experience. And again, this is, we've, we've got this on a, on a very small level, um, at, at least in the Bologna process when we talk about accreditation of prior learning, but it's much, much bigger than that. It's firstly really recognizing yep. what people have done already and then kind of adapting um, the yep. study programs and the learning models around that. So on the one hand, you need a lot of yep. support at the beginning, but you also need a lot of adaptation to the specific needs and yep. specific interests and specific competencies uh, of this group. So then I just wanted to give you um, three small examples of things that I think are interesting in that context. And I'm sorry, I have to use Kieran as well. Um, we have our own uh, app now, uh, which, we, uh, use for, which we offer for our students. We really are trying to offer what we're calling wide, wide open learning um, through the digital, uh, digital platform that we have. And we're focused, as I said, on refugees. We have 7,000 refugees um, in our, on our learning platform. They are our learners. Originally, this was, as I said, an initiative to support refugees who, were, who came to Germany and were having the problem that the universities wouldn't accept that these people had any kind of you know, knowledge or competencies because... In Germany, we're quite bureaucratic. It was the question, okay, can you, can you prove that? And they're like, no, I was fleeing. And so um, we kind of stepped in then as Kiron as a kind of bridging to say, okay, we'll take any of these refugees, we'll support them in their learning, and we'll have a partnership with these universities and say, okay, we can tell you they've been on our program for a year or so, this is what they've learned, and then we um, hope that the university will not only accept them, but also maybe recognize some of the learning they've done with us to actually speed up their learning programs. And um, the, the big impetus behind this and the reason why this kind of got a lot of traction in Germany is because um, the biggest uh, group of refugees we were getting in Germany were from Syria, and everyone knew the Syrian uh, education system is, is pretty good. So um, that's how it started. This year we've made a lot of changes because we realized that our problem is the bottleneck is still the university because the university is still causing problems and we realize we're doing stuff that the university would like to do themselves anyway. So we've spent the year now working on um, short programs, much more focused on what we think our learners need and want and we're just about to launch um, early next year then an open badge program where we can think of how can we offer these kind of alternative credentials for the students. So 
On the other hand, we still have the problem, and that's something, again, we'll be working on next year, which is how can you build a community around this digital learning piece? Because that's a, that's a key element. We have come, we, we focus really this year very much on the kind of the content side, and now next year we need to focus more on the educational side to really make this much more valuable for our students. But we have a lot of interaction with, this, with our students, and we do know it's empowering them, it's helping them, it's, uh, they, they find this very important, and we do have students who go on then to study in German universities and are successful as well. But So this is one way you can think of... Um, being more flexible about what we mean by higher education, because um, we, in our very first iteration, we were called the Kiron University, and then we got in big trouble. Um, so that's why we're called higher education now. Um, but I think these, this kind of provision is actually very important, and this is a bit to my point where I think on the phrase of the normal system, this kind of uh, development, and Kiron is just one example, is happening a lot. And it's a question of can that be built back or, or integrated better into the formal system as well. Talking of um, this whole thing of commu build, building communities around uh, a digital learning platform, uh, we, we at Kiron were involved in a, a project uh, which, is, which was commissioned by uh, the European Commission. And it's called uh, Erasmus Plus uh, Virtual Exchange. And it's exactly focused on this point, which is um, it's the idea that uh, many people uh, would like to have exchange. You know the Erasmus program as something which, was, uh, which is very, very um, successful also in, in promoting physical mobility uh, within Europe particularly. But it's very exclusive. So um, even the European benchmark for um, the physical mobility is 20% of graduates should have experienced physical mobility during their studies. So that's a high number, but it's what about the 80%? So I think what's happened here, and this was again one of these things which started focusing really much more on, okay, what about if we're thinking of this mobility question outside of Europe? This virtual exchange is super relevant also within Europe as well. And uh, I was uh, discussing this a little bit last week with the European Commission and some of these ideas of, of at least blended uh, learning will be built into the next uh, program. So you can see that even within the, the kind of the established system, there are more ideas of trying to flexibilize um, learning and also make it more open to more people. And the last example I wanted to give, um, I mentioned already, I'm um, uh, Kieran, we're part of the, uh, the what's called the UFA Alliance, Young Universities for Europe. Um, this was a big um, initiative from, I think, about two years ago where the European Commission um, said, uh, wouldn't it be great if we had uh, uh, European universities as collaborations between universities and it's very interesting there are um, 17 alliances at the moment and suddenly actually within this context many many of the uh, alliances are thinking really quite out of the box about how to organize studies so one of the things that we at Kiron are particularly working on is what's being called the virtual campus and it should be a way of connecting students between all of the, um, the eight universities. In fact, it's, it's more than that because we've just merged the official partners and the associate partners. So all of the partners will be much more uh, uh, net connected through the network. So this is a way of us expanding in that way um, through digitalization, these learning opportunities. Um, I just wanted to mention also uh, another thing that's been mentioned a few times before, uh, Open Education for a Better World, which is, um, uh, it, it, the deadline is passed, but I'm told that really, really interesting submissions might still have a chance. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention in con connection to that is the Leadership in Open Education program, uh, which we're developing. Um, these kind of things are important because I, I'm really, you can see very much about how I'm arguing, I'm really interested in all of this stuff, but only when we think about how do we really bring it into the mainstream and how do we use it to change the mainstream. I really, I, I really would like us not always to be on this kind of, this edge piece. 
So then I think we really can, after all that, then we can start thinking about all of these things like open education, open educational resources, artificial intelligence, etc. Um, but I think it's really, really important. We know what the challenges are outside. We know it's about changes in the job market, changes um, to uh, knowledge and the competency profiles that are expected of students, of learners, of citizens in society. We know there's a whole uh, a lot of demographic changes happening and technology, of course, um, there's a lot of changes there. But the most important thing is to think of all of that from the learner perspective. However, when we then kind of make a flip and think, okay, what does that all mean? Um, then I think uh, the scheme that, uh, that Rob, Martin Weller and I uh, developed um, for what we call the OFAT study is a kind of helpful way to then think about, okay, what is what work is then to be done to try and think about how can we change the learning experience. Um, this goes back a little bit to this idea of unbundling, but I'm really mo most keen to think of how this is all connected. Um, so very often when we're thinking of changes, we often only think of certain parts of this, this whole kind of cake here, which is, um, of course, one of the points is, you know, what is the access and the delivery of the learning opportunity? This would be something where digital can play a huge role. This is where we think of, you know, different access uh, regulations to help students also get into university. Um, and then, though, because we know we've got then a, div a diverse group, an increasingly diverse group, which we welcome, then we also have to think about what kind of learning content support and what kind of didactics do we need to support that and of course the ideas of co-creation play I think a key role here because we shouldn't try and second guess things we can build the creation part into the educational process itself but we mustn't forget about the recognition and certification of knowledge and competencies and um, I'm, I'm also a little bit involved in kind of the open badge stuff and the open badge guys, they say, don't talk to me about content. I'm not interested. I'm only interested in my badges. And I think it's really important that we always think about, you know, how do we bring this all together? And that's really my point here, is to, is, is to really think, how can we bring this all together? How can we think about OER as a key element to all of these changes and to supporting our students but also think, okay, if we've got OER, what are the other elements we need to make sure that that creates a, a comprehensive and uh, coherent system for the learner, which is useful for the learner after their studies as well. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> okay, we'll do it again. Thank you very much for a very insightful um, talk, Dominique. The, the four pathways, I found that fascinating. But they're all plastic or very rigid toys, so I would challenge that. I <laughs> would like to have a conversation, because we talk about flexibility and molding, and I thought some Play-Doh would be lovely. <laughs> so maybe you <laughs> can think about that. Um, so any questions from the audience? Okay, Virginia. Hi, Dominique. Nice, nice talk. Um, my question is about uh, the uh, hacker education landscape in the world. Because uh, I feel sometimes that uh, when uh, from the global north talk about Hacker education institutions uh, are often referring uh, to their model of uh, hacker education that is quite uh, um, uh, elitist and uh, very selective. Uh, and uh, hacker education is very different in each part of the world. Uh, for example, in Latin America, hacker education is uh, has a more social and uh, connected with the uh, society uh, model. We don't have, for example, in my country, we, we don't have selective process. Uh, 
we have a lot of uh, difficulties to be inclusive because uh, people do, doesn't uh, achieve uh, secondary uh, to finish secondary school, for example, right. and we have a lot of uh, difficulties, for example, in uh, in relation to uh, um, um, social conditions, for example, and economy. So, um, how we uh, can um, uh, think in, a, in in models that uh, uh, can uh, take. Uh, on account the different kinds of model of uh, universities and uh, I, I don't know, for example, how is uh, this the models in Asia, for example, or in Africa? They are very different and have different missions. So I think uh, we can we have to think in different students also. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Um, of course, there's always difference, but I think still this kind of this model, which we're calling Tamagotchi, that's everywhere. Yeah. It really, really is, and 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 that's that's part of it. Because once you you know, when we were doing this study, then um, you know, also the ministry is saying, yeah, but what about quality assurance? What about how you're going to fund those different forms? And we said, okay, let's leave all these governance questions later. But I think the huge expansion we've had in higher education across the world in the last, particularly in the last 20 years, has been driven by one idea of one model and has been uh, accompanied by a certain form of governance, which in the end has led to a lot of bureaucracy, which has uh, limited the chances within higher education to experiment, particularly with teaching and learning. So there are, there are, you're quite right, of course, you can always find really great initiatives, but not on a kind of systematic scale. And I think um, we still must really be serious about the fact that higher education is absolutely exclusive everywhere. You can go to um, Latvia, uh, no, sorry, Lithuania, and 74% of um, uh, people in a cohort go to higher education. But half of those are paying for their studies, and the other half are paying nothing. So we've got all the, the system is always built in a very exclusive way. So we, have, so we have to kind of tackle these bigger things first. But I think, of course, when we start thinking of, you know, how do you actually implement or how do you actually change, then you have to go to the real context and think about how can you build it around the real context and interest. But, you know, the other thing is there hasn't been enough focus in higher education on teaching and learning in the last 20 years either because everyone was focused on research and expanding numbers of students. So the challenge is there, but uh, of course there are differences uh, within and between countries. Um, and when we, I've just been in West Africa very recently, and um, in West Africa, you know, it's a bit irrelevant what the universities do because it's only 3% of a cohort who go to the university. So when we then think about what we want to do, we have to de totally think outside of the model. So I think, we, I think part of our problem in, in, uh, in development in every country has been we're too focused on what we think the formal system should be like and it's normally based on a legacy from before. And of, you can, for sure, as you say, see historical legacies within different higher education systems which make them different. But I think on this very high level, they're still not flexible enough and that's why they're so exclusive. Thank you. Uh, yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, first, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, so much inspirations uh, in uh, so brief time. Uh, actually, um, but uh, uh, I, I am uh, wondering if uh, universities uh, nowadays are enough uh, vital. Uh, for uh, rethinking uh, their self uh, in uh, a jingle Lego set of transformers model, or if this transformation uh, has to come from outside. For example, are universities the best uh, social subject for developing uh, a new mode for uh, evaluating competencies? 
I'm not sure. What, what do you think about it? Mm. I think this is really to my point that I really think over the last 20 years through expansion, we've developed a whole load of things which are really just artifacts which we can question. And, you know, we've, uh, and a, a lot of it has been to cope with expansion. So really, I mean, I, I understand the perspective of, from the uh, university leadership as well, and also from policy, which is, you know, let's try and keep it simple so we can keep the expansion working properly. But um, I think now it's time to rethink all of these things properly. And uh, I really think it's disappointing if we see that the, the only really interesting things are happening at the peripheral outside of the formal system. And, and that's, that's the most disappointing piece, of, I think, because if you, if you ask what is the, 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 the kind of common understanding of a university of itself, it says it's, you know, experimental, it's always thinking of its place in society, but it's been a bit lazy over the last 20 years on this thing, I think. So I, I think that's why we have to rethink that, and, and, and that's why it's really great that, you know, people like us have the opportunity and we see now there is a change, I think, where on a strategic level there's more openness for quite a few of these things. But then we have to start playing the game of realizing how do we sell cool ideas to a, a mainstream system. And I th that's a huge challenge, I think. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk and uh, interesting analogy. I've been thinking in the similar line and, and come to the conclusion that in order to really make that happen and possible, the learners, individual, have to own their own learning and data. And if we, we are all institutionally oriented and thinking yes. in terms of institution, institutional framework, you mentioned that uh, uh, the ecosystem, stuck in the ecosystem of institution, yeah. but um, um, how can actually make that individual at the center and the owner of all the learning, um, that would be ideal, but there's not much incentive for industry and not much incentive for, for prop probably individual government in a sense because it will become less controllable. Um, do you think that's really possible? Or do you think that would be the direction we should actually work towards? So I think, uh, to your point, the, the thing I'm worried about is if we say, you know, and this is a bit of the, the Lego model, if you just say, okay, it's really up to the, the, the learner, they kind of put it all together themselves, then you're expecting an awful lot of that person to be able to do it, and it becomes socially ex selective for sure, because some people come from a group where they can ask their friends and their parents, another group, no one around them has got any experience of that. So then you have to think about, okay, well, what kind of support could be given on another level? And I think really it's, it's a lot to do with the fact that uh, I think universities can pick this up. And it has been interesting for me to see what has happened with this university, uh, this European university initiative, because it's kind of forced the universities to think about, okay, what would it be like to have teaching and learning if you're not one institution but eight and you all have, you're all doing it together. And somehow that's already opened up some of these questions that are, uh, are key to us anyway. So because we know this kind of collaborative thinking can be helpful. So it's been interesting to see that that happens. I think there is a certain openness on the policy level as well. Um, but, of course, if you always think from an, uh, the institutional perspective of a university, of course they're firstly thinking, right, have I got enough money to do this? How am I going to keep my staff? We know in many, many countries at the moment, academics are having a more and more precar precarious uh, career. So it's difficult to build them, to, to, to bring them into something where they're supposed to be more kind of experimental and expensive. So there, we've got huge problems here. But this is why I think part of the solution is to not just think of this as higher education on its own, but think of really how can we have a, a good educational provision throughout somebody's uh, life, lifespan. And then when you start 
thinking like that, then there's a lot of things, but they're just not connected. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of government, government bodies or support systems for the individual pieces, but they're never really thought from the perspective of the student. They never thought systematically. They just thought from the perspective, okay, I'm representing this sector or this issue or unemployed people, and that's part of the problem. So somehow we need a, a new, bigger perspective. But maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, there seems to be a, a certain openness on the policy level for that, I think. And maybe, I mean, if we work more on you know, monitoring and evidence that we can use for that, that helps. So I've, this, this has been, uh, for sure, I was very surprised with this study because it's been very welcomed by the German ministry. And Germany, I, d I don't know what you guys think of Germany, but Germany is not a leader in innovation. No way. <laughs> Germany is good at doing the next bit, but new ideas don't tend to come from Germany. And, and, and it was very interesting to see that they could really work with this idea. So, but of course, for the, the policy level, their next thing is, okay, this is all very cool. Which bit are we as policy uh, 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 responsible for? But that's, that's then the next piece. But yeah, so we need this. It's not enough to leave it to the student, I think, but having the student perspective is, should be key to policy as well. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Interesting what you say about the Germans. Um, the Germans always say, Vorsprung durch Technik. Yeah, so, durch Technik, nicht yeah. durch Innovation. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's a, man there's braucht a lady Innovation. Here, I okay, I, one more question. But there's coffee also waiting. I know the, the conversation is really interesting. I have another one. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. And Tamagotchi sounds very familiar to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my organization, ASCA Academy, is now planning to issue open badges to those who completed our courses in, uh, translated in Japanese. And in that sense, I would like to ask you, what are the benefits and the challenges of open badges yeah. to be used for this OER field? Thank you. Yeah, that's maybe a nice thing to finish on because I think this connection is really important with the open badges. Um, we've just, uh, just I think two days ago, we released a, a, an English language uh, study that we'd done in Germany on uh, discussions we had about open badges in the German setting. Um, and we've also sketched there three different scenarios for how you can use badges. Um, I don't think it's useful to have badges which just replicate what you get anyway on your certificate. And that's the kind of thing that makes everyone nervous. Because they think, okay, but this, is, this badge thing is kind of... But if you... If, uh, I think badges... Um, and badges is a terrible name. It's just a, a, a digital format of documentation which is highly standardized and enables you to make lots of links to lots of other things which you can never do on a piece of paper. That's what's cool about the badge. But the, the nice thing is also that um, you can be slightly more flexible. So the badge... I think is really important for the kind of what I was calling the bits of the university experience which tend not to be replicated in your transcript of records or your certificate. And that is really important for the learner, I think, because that gives them something super useful for when they leave uh, college as well. So, great initiative. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>